This is Problem Solved, the IISE podcast, where we talk to industrial and systems engineers about their work, ideas, and solutions. Hello, and welcome to another episode of Problem Solved, the IISE podcast. This is the third in our series on career paths, and we have two very special guests today. We have Paul Lodomarok and Karina Suarez. Welcome, Paul and Karina. Paul, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? I'm living here in sunny Florida. Uh, I live on Anastasia Island. I moved here about two and a half years ago. Used to live in the Atlanta area. Uh, I'm in my third career. My first career was academia. Uh, that lasted about eight and a half years. I was My degrees are in mathematics, actually. My second career was in corporate America with NCR for about 10 and a half years. Uh, also included the AT&T Bell Labs and, and the AT&T uh, Bell Systems. And um, my third career, I started in 1995 as a, um, for lack of a better term, consultant. And I've been doing this since uh, September 15th of 1995. And here I am today, 20 some odd years later. Wow. With, uh, many clients and many projects. Awesome. And Karina, can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Well, I am living currently in Wisconsin. Um, I have a double major. I am an industrial engineer and I got also a business and marketing uh, bachelor's degree. I came to the U.S. to uh, get my master's degree in industrial engineering and a minor in business as well. And currently I'm working for FedEx Ground as an engineer in the first and last mile engineering group. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you, Karina. Thank you, Paul, for joining us today. I'm really excited to have you. And of course, you guys have a little bit of history uh, since you guys had a class together that uh, Paul led and that Karina participated in. So we'll talk a little bit about that along the way. But I, I thought I'd actually start. Paul mentioned that he's in his third career, and uh, that's really impressive. He's got, uh, gosh, such an impressive resume. In your first career, Paul, you taught math and computer science to kind of all all ages, right? You went from <laughs> little kids to to big kids <laughs> to adults um what's changed and what stayed the same from a education perspective well what's interesting um a lot of that realm of uh, that range of students had to do with a with a uh, graduate program i was uh, involved in and uh, my research to get my master's degree uh at the time this was in the early 1980s uh at the time well, there was this emerging tool called a microcomputer. <laughs> and at that point, they were, we were researching how the microcomputer would be applied in society, trying to make some predictions. And so the mathematics department, which also contained the computer science department at the University of South Carolina, uh, came up with a program for me and some research for me to take a look at the application of microcomputers in society from everything from preschool to uh, post PhD. And during that research, I was able to take a look at how uh, they would be applied at, with a younger child that, that didn't even read very much and four and five year olds that, that read very little and looked at um, uh, uh, an application program called uh, Lo a Logo that was provided by Seymour Papert at MIT and we were studying how they learned from the system and how they controlled the system all the way through to the PhDs who were part of my student base uh, for my research as well. And what makes it very interesting is at that time, the University of South Carolina was the leading uh, organization, uh, leading university uh, for telecommunications and television uh, across the country. And so we put together some graduate courses that were broadcast throughout the state of South Carolina with an audio connection. So we could do Zooming, if you will, Zooming in 1980, the way we did Zooming with Karina uh, just this past uh, month. <laughs> wow. And so it was rather interesting how much it's changed. It's changed quite dramatically because television and audio connections are now all integrated into one technology. And so that remote learning, as it was back then, was something we predicted, and now we have it, goodness gracious, 40 years later. So that's kind of how it's evolved. 
Wow. That's really neat, Paul. And uh, really interesting that you were able to look that far forward then. So I think we, if, you know, if we need to uh, find out like the winning lottery numbers or any, anything like that, are you the man to ask? <laughs> well, with my degrees in mathematics, I can give you some predictions, but I can't give you any, <laughs> any winners. I haven't had any myself. <laughs> Is the prediction that the house always wins? <laughs> <laughs> the house always wins. <laughs> <laughs> well, Karina, Paul was talking about uh, distance learning and Zooming, and I know that you just took a Zoom class uh, with Paul. Um, yeah. Can you tell us tell us a little bit about what drew you to IISE uh, for for your professional development and and how the class went with Paul? Uh, sure. So, um, as I said, um, I. I am an industrial engineer, so uh, thanks to the FedEx uh, company membership, I became a member of the IASC. So I periodically receive the communications about the new courses, seminars, and other training sessions. Um, oh, great. Are those emails work. Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, that's that's yeah. good for us to know. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> the Institute always keeps us uh, updated on the latest advances in our engineering field. So, it does work. <laughs> um, so yeah, when I saw uh, the a lean green belt curse in the newsletter, I thought that was the perfect opportunity to refresh my knowledge in the field and explore improvement ideas to implement in my current role. Um, so this was a great experience uh, that basically reminded me why I chose this career. It was oh, to, make, to make people's life easier with basic tools. Um, yeah, so that, that was that, the reason. Oh, that's really great, Karina. That's yeah. really great. And and how was how was that technology? You know, I know it's um, we, we've really had to adapt a lot over the last year in terms of how learners learn. And, you know, um, live streaming courses wasn't something we did regularly a year ago, but it's something we do regularly now. How, how did that work for you? Well, uh, it was at the very beginning when all this pandemic ex started, that was completely new to me. But now that I get used to it, because currently I'm working from home. Right. So it's like, uh, it's a new norm, the new sure. normal, I'd say. So it was great. It was uh, easy, easy for me to, to attend the course being at home and then continue with my job. So it was great. It was not, not much of, a, of an issue. Good. That's good. And then at least you didn't have to uh, get on a plane and find a hotel and <laughs> all Correct. of those things. So, yeah. Correct. It was perfect. Uh, and it was uh, very, very funny to see like every morning when we get connected. So Paul was in one place and my other uh, classmate was in another place and I was in Wisconsin. So right. <laughs> <laughs> it, it was it was great. It was amazing. A great experience. <laughs> How about for you, Paul? How was the experience for you? Well, uh, kind of springboarding off what she just said, we would uh, check temperatures with each other in the morning when we got <laughs> on the line. And her temperature was about six degrees. And my temperature was about 66 or 70 degrees. And so we could tell that there's a bit of a difference. And the nice thing is she didn't have to go outside. She could just right. stay, right. tune in, get on, get it over with not even have to leave the building and go out into that frigid winter that they were having at that time. That's right. Because I think the temperatures are ranging six and seven and eight degrees every day. And so it is more beneficial to do it that way. The only thing we really missed was the on-site um, activities that we do as far as modeling or as far as simulations and things of that nature. But other than that, it was all about the same and even better. The dialogue and discussions were fantastic. And so we had a really good time with it. And again, it's lower in expense. Didn't have to pay for travel, didn't have to pay for meals, didn't have to pay for all the uh, commute from the airport to the location and those kind of things. So it actually was lower in cost. It was the same as far as knowledge transfer. The only shortcoming was the in-person activities. And that's right. that's about it. Right. Yeah. And we've heard that from a lot of students and, and instructors, too, that while live streaming courses isn't a perfect substitute for being live in person, it's pretty darn good. And it has some benefits that that, that you can't replicate <laughs> live in person, um, it, not the least of which is minimizing your uh, time outside of the classroom and your expense outside of the classroom. So you can really focus on the classroom activities. 
It's interesting because a lot of times in um, within lean, I would preach faster, better, and more affordable. Right. Well, this has all the faster, the better, and the more affordable as far as the ability to to communicate and transfer knowledge without having that excess time. That's true. That's true. We've we've cut out a lot of the non value added activities, haven't we? Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Paul. In my defense, we are on the thirties now, so. Nice. Very nice. You're getting up there. <laughs> almost, yeah. a, almost a heat wave. <laughs> <laughs> almost there. <laughs> well, Paul, Karina mentioned earlier that the class, you know, helped her remember why she does what she does and, you know, the importance of helping people do their job better, make their job easier. Um, you've taught hundreds, probably thousands of students for IISE over the years. What, what makes teaching rewarding for you? Well, one of the things that I, I like about what we do and how we do it is, is I learn myself from the students in some examples that they can bring to the to bear to the table. Yeah. Uh, some of the examples that we discussed in class, especially, for example, in FedEx and some of the other types of organizations, we can use real time examples to at least discuss the applications and the ability to uh, apply. Now, what I like about it is these are the types. And like I said, I, I have been exposed to education programs at all levels. But these are the type of programs that people come to because they want to. It's not because they have to. Right. So sometimes when I was doing things like uh, safety or quality, there were times when there were people involved that had to be there. Yeah. It's not that they wanted to be there. So when we do these kind of programs, it's because they want to. It's not because they have to. And it's a much better crowd. It's much better dialogue. And it's much richer in experience. I think you're spot on. And, you know, I've, I've always said for any class I ever taught, I think I learned more from the students than they learned from me. I mean, every class, <laughs> every class I hear an example or a new way of looking at something that I had never thought of before. So and it's, it's always as an instructor, a really enriching experience too. It has been to my benefit that I can even take some student examples out to my practice. So from when I'm not doing the knowledge transfer, I'm doing projects. Right. And when I'm out doing projects, often is the case, I can take some of those examples out to provide other experiences and knowledge and understanding to some of my clients. Yeah, absolutely. And I'm I'm wondering from Karina's perspective, did you have that same experience, Karina? Was there was there anything you took away from the course that you were able to apply right away, either at work or at home? Yes, certainly. Um, actually, I'd say that there were two uh, valuable lessons I learned from the course. Uh, the first one uh, is to listen to the customer. And the second one is improve communication. Um, so when I started listening and making my internal customers more involved in my processes, I saw how our communication improved substantially. Um, so for example, uh, in my current role, I provide engineering support to our stations across the country uh, where packages are picked up, sorted and delivered. Uh, so the stations are my customers. So I basically design engineering solutions considering different variables that impact the daily operations of our stations. Right. Um, and the way the process works for you to have an idea is the station submits a request, I run the analysis, come up with an engineering solution, and uh, translate that into financial terms. Sure. So I decided to start reaching out more with the field with the field staff uh, more frequently, asking for details about their submissions, including them in the preview, uh, listening to my customers. Right. So uh, this simple step made them feel part of my process of the whole process. So uh, almost instantaneously, they started providing great inputs that facilitated my analysis. Um, their inputs helped me come up with more accurate proposals, actually. Um, and they also felt more confident to call me or email me uh, more frequently. The communication between uh, the field locations and the corporate uh, side improved significantly. So now they, I'm proud to say that they not, uh, they do not submit the request with the problem only. 
but I also propose a way to solve it. Oh, wow. So they became part of the solution. So that was great. Oh, that is awesome. That's a really awesome story, Karina. I, I, um, I know when I was a young engineer, I thought I thought I was, uh, I don't know if I thought I was pretty smart, but at least I thought I, I knew how to solve the problem because I went to engineering school, you know, and uh, it didn't take me long to realize that the people who do the work know way more than I'll ever know about the problem and how to solve it. And so I think you're exactly right. Building those relationships with, with people who uh, are on the the front lines who do the work. Um, that's gosh, they can make you look like a hero and make the whole business look great. <laughs> so, uh, that's wonderful. That's, uh, that's a really awesome story. <laughs> I, I knew that I knew that, uh, I gotta get the inputs from people that work in the front line. And for some reason I forgot about it. So <laughs> attending this course helped me remember the basics and that was great. That's awesome. I, I think it's so easy to to forget, you know, some of those yeah. things sometimes, and uh, mm-hmm. those fundamental lessons. I, it's great that we have folks like Paul there to <laughs> to mentor us and guide us and and and, yeah. and remind us what's really really important. Well, kind of coming back to Paul from a from a mentoring perspective, um, Paul, you've you've mentored so many people over the years. What's your favorite part about mentoring? One of the things that I noticed, and, and even Karina just mentioned it um, earlier, um, is the memory jogger piece. Often as a mentor, it's not that you're telling them, teaching them, or providing them with a solution, but you're just jogging their memory to recall ways or pathways in their brain that they can then also apply that they may have applied before. So the, some of the mentoring I found out wasn't necessary that I was teaching or I was coaching. Right. But the mentoring was I was getting them to realize and to relive moments that they could leverage. that They already know the answer or they already understand something that could be applied to the answer. Yeah. So the coaching piece is more or less the skill development, the knowledge development. Uh, the mentoring piece has to do with reconnecting with purpose. So that's the thing that I realized about the mentoring, that mentoring is more reconnecting with purpose while coaching was developing skills. Yeah. The teaching part was only transferring knowledge. And when we get out there and we start experiencing uh, examples or at least simulations or at least uh, exercises that gives them capability. So the teaching is only knowledge transfer. When we develop capabilities, that's the full coaching example. Yeah. The mentoring is reconnecting the, the individual with their purpose. And that's really what I gained from from all through the years of trying to mentor people in in that manner. I love that uh, that idea, Paul. I can imagine this triad uh, of um, a, sort of a Venn diagram of coaching, teaching, mentoring, <laughs> and and you know each of those playing an important role in in the development in professional development. And um, gosh, I, I think that's really wise. I, I love the idea that um, that mentoring is sort of um, uh, reconnecting to that muscle memory, the things that you already know, <laughs> but, but you don't always, they're not always front of mind. And so how do you, how do you reconnect to a really positive experience you had using that tool or that skill so that you remember you need to use it more often? That's uh that's really profound. To add to that, if we think about it and just to springboard off of what you just said, when we can add to that, when we transfer the knowledge through these programs, that, that is only part of it. That is not the end of it. Only until they do will they know. So they'll (laughs) understand the knowledge and the detail and the content because they're all smart folks. I mean, most of them are all engineers or business majors or in Karina's case, both. Right. (laughs) And uh, when we go to the next level of experiential learning, that's the development of the human. So our ultimate goal isn't just to go through these courses and transfer the knowledge. Our ultimate goal is to develop the human being. It's human development is what it actually is. Absolutely. Yeah, I think you hit the nail on the head. Karina, how do you feel about that that triad of coaching, mentoring, and teaching? Well, I would take a part of what you just said and a part of what uh, Paul mentioned. So you learn, because I had also the experience of being a professor for over two years. Uh, I taught a class online. I didn't yeah. know that. Oh, now yeah. we're learning something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So uh, when you uh, 
try to learn from your audience, that's what helps you as well as a, as a trainer, as a, as a professor. So you gotta, it's a, to me, it's a win-win. I try to teach them from my experience, but I also learn from the students. So um, yeah, it's, to me, it's a great experience. I didn't think that I had the ability to teach something, but speaking from my uh, own experience helped me a lot. So I, I'd say that I learned from my students' experiences. They learned from mine. So it was a, a very rich experience for, for both, for both yeah, sides. That makes sense. Well, and I'm, I'm thinking about um, how you keep students engaged. And I'm wondering if, if you, uh, with that experience teaching, did that help you um, be a better student? <laughs> and also uh, as a student, did, it help that, did that help you be a better teacher? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, it certainly helps because you remember what you wanted to get from your professor when you were a student and you try to deliver the same experience to your students. So, yeah, it helps. So uh, in in the case of uh, to your question, if I think what motivates me as a student, yeah. I'd say that mainly to evidence how the theory can be put into practice. How can we make things real so going to this course this this allowed me to not only refresh the link concepts that i had but to see how they really work in the real life right so that's a, a good way that i'd say uh paul found in the in the class to keep us motivated as a, as a tutor uh he used to ask us every day what did you do lean right the day before so that that was a good strategy as a professor i'd say to keep the students engaged because i found myself applying five s's at home for example absolutely or, that I organized uh, Kaizen teams at work, not knowing that I was doing it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, improving. Uh, I found myself also, as I said before, improving, improving communication amongst the different levels in the organization. Uh, so knowing that I'm really applying what I am learning, that kept me engaged to the course. And I, I'd say that it, that's the rule in general in my learning process. Uh, and also being able to, to share my professional experiences and try to analyze them from different perspective perspectives also keeps that's me great. engaged. Yeah. That's awesome. It reminds me, I, I had a friend uh, who uh, used to co-teach with me some uh, in some lean courses and uh, he would come in every morning and tell the class about uh, what he had 5 S at his house. He was slowly going, this is well before Marie Kondo, but he was slowly going room by room, 5 Sing his entire <laughs> house. And so, you know, it would be, you know, I 5 S five the pantry last night and you know, he'd have his before and after pictures. <laughs> so. Oh yeah. The pictures, the pictures are interesting. <laughs> Yeah. Picture's worth a thousand words. I tell you, that's a, that's another uh, lean concept that always resonates with me. It's uh, yeah. from a visual management perspective, it's hard to beat a picture. <laughs> <laughs> yes. Oh my gosh. Well, we've, we've talked a little bit about how things have been different over the last year um, from a learning perspective, but how about just in general, how, how have you guys adapted over the last year? What's, what's been different for you? Uh, I, I will let uh, Paul, go first. <laughs> oh, smart. I'd, I'd smart. be happy to go first. I, I'm just <laughs> waiting. I'm not. Uh, I've increased as far as the percentage of my work, uh, a large percentage of my work used to be on site in, with projects. Yeah. Um, in this past year, that's gone down and the involvement uh, as far as virtual involvement has increased and gone up. Sure. So uh, this, this whole, uh, COVID experience, if you will, has actually benefited me where I don't have to travel. Right. A lot of times in my work, I have to get on a plane. I have to go to some wherever it is. And I've been all over the world doing this <laughs> and, you know, spend all my time in the air, in a hotel, uh, getting to and from the location. But now I have a core location. I'm able to do that through the technology. Uh, maybe it's not as rich as the on-site location as far as the uh, the experiential give and take, but the dialogues, the discussions, and those kind of things uh, have improved with the technology. So I guess at this time, the technology is just ripe for the picking. 
And so it's also good too that I learned also with experiential uh, the provisioning of this material. For example, when uh, Karina and the other student was Carolyn, Carolyn was in uh, LA. And there was a point in time where I could not get one of the visuals on the screen through the technology. Right. Carolyn said, send it to me. So we <laughs> sent it to her. And she's a Purdue student. I think she's a junior this year. Yeah. So I sent it to her and she could participate by putting it on the screen. That's resilient. Now, the next day, it wasn't a problem. Right. The day before that, it wasn't a problem. <laughs> but that day, and we I can't explain it to this moment, we could not get that that one image on the screen. I sent it to her. She put it on the screen. So if a student can participate in providing the knowledge transfer, that is worth so much more. So my on-site activities went down and my virtual activities, of course, went up. My projects diminished and my uh, and my online knowledge transfer increased dramatically. Yeah. And so that's what's happened, say, in the last year. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And that, what a great example of resilience there, uh, Paul, that, you know, <laughs> one path was blocked, so you found another. Well, it's just by necessity. Another interesting thing is, you know, we've done, uh, goodness, we started the uh, university program with certification about 10 years ago, I guess, I, maybe even more. And through those years, uh, we've always done it on site. You know, LSU, USC, Texas A&M, Georgia Tech, Virginia Tech, even Toronto and places like that. But now we're starting to see others emerge because of, of this opportunity. Ryerson University, we had not even touched them for the last 10 or so years. And they're uh, their university out of Canada. Yeah. And so we're now delivering to locations that we normally would have thought about going on site, like I said earlier. But now I, we've got, uh, with Ryerson University, a lot of the students were not even there. I had one student that was in uh, Jeddah. I had one student that was in uh, Karachi. Wow. I had a few more students that were uh, in the United States. One was in Tampa. One was in uh, somewhere in Colorado. And then the rest of the students, since it was a Canadian university, were scattered all across Canada. So we were able to deliver in a very uh, effective manner the material that we had to put everybody gathered on site to do. And so that's another part of the before and the after with what's happened now. So we can touch many more people in many more ways without having to have everybody in one room. So uh, that, that's, that's another one of the, the differences between before and after. Yeah, I think it's a great point. Our our reach is so much broader than it's ever been. How about for you, Karina? What's what's changed? How have you adapted over the last year? Well, it was certainly a year of changes. Uh, working from home, as I said at the beginning, was the main change I had to adapt to. Uh, but fortunately, the nature of my job made it relatively easy. So uh, I was able to move my office cubicle to my living room where I am at right now. <laughs> um, so the, the flexibility of the company I work for helped enormously on facing, on facing this challenge. Um, for example, I needed a bigger screen other than my laptop. They provided the monitors, the monitors for that. I needed to stay in touch with the field locations. They provided a work phone for that. That's great. Um, I was allowed to even bring my uh, office chair home uh, so also the support of my colleagues through chats, calls, uh, video conferences, etc., trying to help each other as much as possible. That was priceless during this transition year. Um, now I can say that I am adapted to the new normal uh, working wise, but the office environment is always missed. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I cannot deny that. And um, personally speaking, um, I keep in touch with my family even more now. Sure. So technology is a good ally in this case. <laughs> and a uh, fun fact that I'd like to share with you guys is that I first met my newborn nephew through a video call. Oh, so, wow. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, I, I, I can consider myself adapted now. Yeah. And congratulations on being a new aunt. 
<laughs> well, and, and I'll say too, I'll, I'll do a shameless plug for FedEx and say, it sounds like you, you work for a great company in terms of how flexible they've been in giving you all the tools to be able to work from home. They have been great. Yeah. yeah that's wonderful. Well, tell me a little bit about in terms of learning, what's the most important thing you've learned over the last year, Karina? I will speak more from a personal uh, perspective other than the professional. I'll take a little bit of of the professional side here, but uh, I learned that you do not have to leave things for later. Uh, You do what you have to do when you have to do it. Live the moment, live the moment intensely and give your best to it because everything can change instantaneously. Um, for example, I regret not taking one more week of vacation uh, with my family because I thought I was going to see them in the next two or three months. Right. Then the pandemic started, started sorry, <laughs> the borders um, were closed and I could see them again in person after one year only. So wow. I'd say the main lesson is do not leave things for later. That's a great lesson. How about for you, Paul? What's the most important thing you learned over the last year? Well, a lot of my learning was gained more um, in a local social uh, uh, type of uh, knowledge uh, gain. Um, what I what was interesting is, <clears throat> gosh, I, I've been on travel for business since I started with NCR in 1985. And so that's what, 35 years ago. And so in the last 35 years, up until last year, a large amount of my uh, exposure in society was on travel. Uh, My wife and I have been married now, what, almost 46 years. And uh, in those 46 years, there are many times when I was out of town. But now in this past year, I really haven't been out of town. And so we gained a whole new appreciation of uh, of the, uh, the the localization of being here all the time. Right. And and I learn more about my my neighborhood. Uh, you know, you, I get more exposed to the neighbors when you're there every day. Right. And if you weren't there but a couple of days a week. <laughs> right. And uh, and that's good and bad. <laughs> I mean, especially in this last season, um, I, I, I gained a lot of knowledge about some neighbors. I didn't know about them politically. And so uh, that was an eye opener and others that I, I learned about them that, um, that I didn't know about them. Yeah. For example, on the corner, uh, Ron and Patsy, uh, he used to be the head of security for the United States Capitol. Oh, wow. Yes. And he's retired. Yeah. And so I went by one day and I said, uh, Hey, uh, by the way, did you get a recall? This was just a couple of weeks ago. I said, did you get a recall to come back up? He goes, first of all, they don't know my phone number. And second of all, I never told them where I went. <laughs> and, uh, you know, things like that, you, you, you learn more about the people around you, uh, right. in my local grocery store. I got, I'm, I, I'm the one doing all the shopping. Yeah. It seems yeah. like. And so I've learned all about the clerks and the, and the managers and uh, the meat guy and the, and the lady in the seafood department and her colleague and the vegetable guy. <laughs> and also being here on the island, Anastasia Island, right here in St. Augustine, um, I walk on the beach every day for, oh, wow. for about an hour a day. Yeah. And so we'll bump into people that we'll see on a regular basis. So, you know, when, when you're walking an hour a day, three miles or whatever it is, where you park and the people that live there and where you walk and the people that you encounter, you learn about their pets and their, right. their, 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 their kids and, and everything else. And sometimes you see them and sometimes you don't see them. <laughs> and sometimes down here we have what we call snowbirds. Right. And we, I found out who are the snowbirds and who aren't the snow, who are the locals. Um, I just met a guy the other day that I see almost every day. He comes to the, where we park to walk. And he and he just parks and sips a coffee and and watches the ocean. Well, I found out he was a nuclear scientist. He was one of the first ones coming out of MIT in 1958. Wow. And so, you know, I learned a lot about the local reality of my culture that I'm living in than I would have if it was one of those regular last 35 years where I'm out of town half the time. Right, right. So uh, my my game more, more is socially than academically. 
So I can say yeah. that. But academic wise, I get some great examples. I years ago when FedEx really started up their FedEx ground uh, in Pittsburgh, uh, Larry had put me in there with them. Uh, to work with them a little bit um, on uh, processes and projects and project scheduling and things like that. And now here we are, I don't know, 15 years later, and Karina comes on the scene. And basically, I had worked with some of those folks when they got that whole program started called FedEx Brown. And I'll be darned. You know, you, I, I've, I've gotten involved with people that have really crossed paths in the past that now we're crossing, kind of crossing paths again in the present. So yeah. that's kind of my, my game. It's a small IE world. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And now that you mentioned that, I remember that Paul and I were talking in one of this, uh, in, in one of our sessions um, about Oregon State University. And uh, um, Paul oh. said that this is a small world because he talked about his um, son-in-law, I guess, it, that attended my school. So I, I am a, a Oregon State University alumni. Yeah. So uh, I was talking about that and he mentions that and we're like, oh yeah, this is a small world. See this? And we started talking about uh, uh, Corvallis and school <laughs> and everything, like the sports and everything. Right. And yeah, it's like, uh, these are opportunities that the new, the new year bring, brings up. Absolutely. Oh, and I just remembered one of the professors, Professor Chinwicky. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, Dr. he's from Sonny. Nigeria. He was one of our black belt graduates uh, several years ago uh, at the uh, at the IISE in uh, Peachtree Corners. He was yeah. one of the students. And uh, Chinwicky was one of uh, Karina's professors. And uh, my son went there for his engineering degree in uh, in uh, forestry uh, engineering and management. And he met his wife, my daughter-in-law. She is with animal science in Oregon State. And so we were able to have that rich discussion. I'll be so darned. it's interesting how a lot of what's been going on is as much a cultural reality as it is a, a knowledge and educational reality. Absolutely. And it's funny, this sort of um, juxtaposition of, you know, with technology, we're able to reach people instantly all across the world. But at the same time, the pandemic has forced us to get to know our neighbors and to know the people that we're around all the time on a deeper level. So it's sort of, <laughs> you know, we've expanded our reach and also narrowed our, our, our reach and understanding. So that's kind of neat. I also think um, that, you know, the old uh, six degrees of separation game, uh, you know, uh, I think it's it might be four degrees of separation for IEs. It doesn't take long for two IEs to figure out where, you know, where they have something in common. <laughs> well, I, I will agree with you on that. <laughs> Looking forward, Karina, what are you interested in learning next? With no doubts, I I will say that the Black Bell Certificate is oh, the plan. Great. I'm very interested in that, but That's let's great. see. Let's see how uh, time works. Uh, yeah. How the, the the activities activities plan for for the year work. Yeah. But let's see, but certainly the black belt certificate is is on That's there. awesome. That's great. There. Yeah. Paul, how about you? What are you interested in learning next? Well, I, I want to learn what my next, my fourth career is going to be. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> that hasn't become apparent yet. With with my COVID haircut, uh, <laughs> which has been growing since last, I guess it was June. I, I could go out on the beach and become one of those beach bums that I see you know, walking up and down the beach. <laughs> things of that nature. So maybe that's where I'm going to learn. Uh, one of the things, <laughs> and and with all the uh, goodness, I look around my library here, I've got about 800 different books collected over the last 30 years. Wow. And uh, I guess it won't be as much uh, textual as it was, would be societal. So I think maybe my next, uh, my next venture would be more of a, a cultural aspect and a societal aspect than it is a scientific aspect. And a, you know, like a lean science aspect. So yeah. extending the lean science into the culture is something I'm, I'm thinking about. One of the things, well, you probably know that I, I wrote the book on affordability Absolutely. and I wrote the book on uh, healthcare affordability. And uh, I think maybe my next uh, could be a government affordability, but I, I think that may be an impossible quest. <laughs> <laughs> it may, it may be. 
knows? Uh, well, and, and you know, I, I, I didn't mention that earlier, Paul. You, you have written extensively on affordability. You've written several books. How do you see lifelong learning in creating value? You know, if we think about affordability, it's all about value, right? So how about lifelong learning and creating value for people? And see, that's also part of that affordability is that is the ability to transfer that value to whomever the target of the customer happens to be. Yeah. So really, it's about the delivery of value to a customer per the requirements, per the needs, for per the uh, regulations that are necessary at some expense, which is a cost factor. So when you you look at the three different dynamics, and again, this this is all lean thinking. This is all industrial engineering thinking. You've got value, you've got customer, and you've got cost. And so at some expense, which is the cost to deliver value, and some price to the customer, which is the cost of the customer, you could look at how it all integrates the delivery of value per the requirements, using resources at a certain expense, getting revenue at a certain price, which actually allows you to do things faster and better and even more affordable. Now, right. This all emerged and it started to become very clear to me when we did a project. It was the IISE project that Dr. Cudney and I did with, uh, with uh, Northrop Grumman on the FNA 18 program. And when we were out there starting in, uh, it was in the beginning of 2007 and it lasted through a, a few years, we were actually able to apply this whole theory of affordability of value delivery per requirements at a certain expense at a certain price we were able to increase the capacity of that plant from 42 to 67 wow we were able to lower the price from 55 million to 49.9 million dollars the base wow. price of that jet and we were able to increase the quality when Beth and I measured it was around 4 to 5 sigma in that range Great. To up to the Six Sigma level, which was less than 3.4 defects per million opportunities. Great. And so when the government purchased that particular product, this was in uh, 2010. You can look it up. Uh, it was uh, a purchase of 124 units uh, for the uh, government. The FNA-18 is a, an air aircraft carrier and, and Marine Corps jet. And the 124 units, when they purchased them at the time, with a cost reduction to the uh, government of $5.1 million, save the American taxpayer over $600 million. Wow. And so when we look at that, when we apply these ideas of value and customer and cost and the integration of that, the whole purpose is to make things go faster, improve the quality of the product, which means conforming to customer requirements and reducing the price and the cost. Right. And so as we apply it going forward, uh, it, we've already gotten proof of that. Another one was the uh, the mine resistant vehicle that was deployed in Afghanistan and Iraq to save uh, lives. The IED, pro, uh, the IED uh, trucks. Yeah. The, to replace the Humvees. We saved over 10,000 lives by deploying uh, 27,500 vehicles in the matter of uh, three years. Wow. And uh, that basically was the reason we didn't lose more than 6,000 lives. Now, right. losing 6,000 lives is bad enough, but we didn't lose 16,000 lives or 26,000 lives or 40,000 lives because we were able to remedy the, the, uh, the opportunity, the problem, the issue with a product that actually applied lean thinking, lean science. Yeah. And so moving forward, it's not just about making things better. It's also about saving lives. It's a great point, Paul. And these things have practical applications, and they and they do literally save lives, um, and and save you and me and and everybody listening some money in their wallet too when it comes to taxpayer dollars. So, <laughs> yeah, I think we're nearing the end of our time. So I, I'd love to close with each of your thoughts on um, the importance of lifelong learning in in your career. What's what has lifelong learning meant for your career over time? I'm going to make Corina go first. Oh, good thinking. <laughs> <laughs> Paybacks are heck. <laughs> fair. That is fair. <laughs> well, um, 
Personally, I'd say that that covers uh, 50% of the spectrum my my life yeah. so uh, it's because i like to keep a solid professional background always i'm always looking for something new to learn uh courses seminars uh training sessions that kind of accompany my work experience because i like to put as i said put into practice what i learn in a real scenario so yeah i couldn't thank my my company enough fedex ground uh for always supporting this uh, professional development desires that's wonderful it's, it's wonderful to to have um an organization that supports you in that way and and um wonderful that that you're you're wired to keep um, to keep learning. Yeah. I think that's, yeah. it's so important in all of our lives. Yeah, that is great. And also, uh, I remember now something that Paul mentioned in, in one of our classes that was that, uh, to keep these lean learning and experience across the company, it's very important to have the support of the champions of the top executives. And that's what I feel here. Uh, it, I have their support and I know that every time that I reach out to them, I will, at least they will hear me. So right. it's great having the support of the, your bosses. That That's great. Yeah, that's, that is a wonderful experience. I've, yeah. I've been in organizations where I didn't have that. And um, oh, boy, yeah. yeah, boy, it's so nice to have that. Yeah. I've, I've been in the other side too. <laughs> so, <laughs> yeah, I know how it feels. That's why I'm, I, I feel very, very thankful for, for that for having that now. Yeah. yeah, that's great. How about for you, Paul? What role has ongoing education and, and development, what's that meant for your career? Oh, goodness. I'll try to shorten the answer. Um, my first uh, exposure to my appreciation for uh, learning, lifelong learning, uh, happened when I first started paying my taxes in 1970, 50 years ago. Uh, I had a summer job. Uh, I was given that summer job. Uh, my dad knew somebody who knew somebody who knew somebody that got me a job uh, helping to build condominiums in uh, Boca Raton, Florida in the summertime. Now, if you've ever been to South Florida in the summertime, you would know how brutal uh, the heat was that, that, in that location and how bad the humidity was near the, near the beach. Of course, after work, I could go in the ocean in the beach, but it was a brutal job. And so uh, it made me start to appreciate uh, the uh, pursuit that I had, which I intended to get a degree in industrial engineering. It just so happened the university that offered me a, a, a sports scholarship was the University of South Carolina, who still to this day doesn't have industrial engineering as a uh, <laughs> they let Clemson do it in South Carolina. <laughs> but so I went to the University of South Carolina because they were going to pay for it. And so and I got it. what sport did you play, Paul? I, I played football there. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Coach Dietzel was the football coach at, uh, at that time. He had come there from LSU and uh, he was the football coach. And then my senior year, Coach Carlin came in from Texas Tech. And uh, so I pursued uh, uh, the next best degree, which I thought was math and computer science. Yeah. So I got my math and computer science degree and I was in my academic part of my career and I was pursuing my master's and I ended up getting that. I was going to pursue my PhD. Well, in the event that I was exposed to the, uh, uh, the, the, the telecommunications and, uh, you know, distance learning and things of that nature, that was another gain in my knowledge and experience uh, for this lifelong learning thing. And I then got exposed to the application of it in corporate, in the corporate world, uh, which was NCR. When I joined NCR in 1985, they were a big advocate of, uh, and I had my master's degree at the time, uh, they were a big advocate of learning and training. One of the big things that they're noted for is their training of, of uh, their whole organization that started way, way back uh, about 1925 or so at a place in Dayton, Ohio called Sugar Camp. And Sugar Camp had, a, had a, a massive training facility in Dayton, Ohio, where they would bring in the salespeople and the engineers and all the different folks from around the company to train them not only in what the company was doing, but also in, to gain knowledge in what they were doing. Well, getting that type of training, and then I got my executive training by the company when I became an executive with that company, and I started seeing the benefits 
of the of the human development side and and the lifelong learning uh, opportunities for people within that corporation. NCR did a great job for me anyway. And that's how I got involved with Larry Aft, who basically just retired from the IISA. Yeah. He was a professor at Southern Poly State University when we needed some uh, training and development in industrial engineering uh, practices and things of that nature in our plant. Right. So I was transferred from Dayton, Ohio to Duluth, Georgia in 1989 with uh, 11 other executives to open a plant. We opened the NCR plant out there in Duluth, Georgia, and we used uh, part of uh, Southern Poly State and a few of the other local uh, organizations for the training and development. Well, the ongoing training and development in that institution gave me even more appreciation for the value and the worth. And and later, earlier in the 90s, later on after a few years, AT&T acquired NCR as their computer uh, production and development arm. And so I was exposed to Bell Labs. Well, here we go. Next step, <laughs> lifelong learning, Bell Labs. Right. So Bell Labs captured me because I had a math degree <laughs> and involved me in some projects with statistics and probability, which got me exposed to the Six Sigma application. Right. So coming out of that with Six Sigma and opening a just-in-time plant with NCR gave me the Lean Six Sigma background for lifelong learning and development of others. When they handed me three projects to start my own business in uh, 1995, and I was involved in uh, knowledge transfer and capability within my my projects, uh, then not only at that point did I get to the next level of understanding of lifelong learning, but I was learning myself from my clients, like like you had sure. mentioned earlier, that you learn a lot from the projects that you're involved in. And so over the past, what, 20 years, since September 15th of 1995, I've not only been engaged in projects with the lifelong learning on site, but I've also been engaged with the lifelong learning with the IISE and a couple of other organizations, primarily the IISE, of the delivery of knowledge and the mentoring and the development of the human and the capability. And so now I've gotten to a point where I'm going to the next level and looking at what is the next step for me on the next path and what's going to be my learning for that next yeah. for that next step, that next path. So uh, I guess I learned till you die. I think so. Yeah, what a so. journey, Paul. So you went, you went from uh, sweating your buns off to football scholarship to, <laughs> uh, to lifelong learner and educator. <laughs> oh, and, and some of it was forced. Right, <laughs> when, uh, right. When AT and T bought the company, they spun NCR. NCR is a company into itself again. They spun NCR back off as a company, now headquartered in Atlanta. Um, they, I was exposed to lifelong learning from that perspective. Now, the way I got my master's degree is South Carolina called me and said, "We've got a program and a project we're thinking about, which is the deployment of microcomputers in society." And they hired me as an adjunct professor. Uh, and, and encouraged me more on this lifelong learning right. thing. And I got my master's degree. And so a lot of this was, was foist upon me, but now I have even more appreciation of the foisting now than I ever did of the foisting <laughs> then. That's right. That's right. So. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Well, I, I tell you, uh, this has been just a, a wonderful hour with, with the two of you. I can't uh, thank you both enough. I've learned so much in the last hour from both of you and learned a lot about each of you too, things I didn't know. So that's great. Uh, and I'd really love to thank you very, very much, Paul and Karina, for your time and for your commitment to IISE and for your commitment to lifelong learning. Because uh, as, we, as we grow individually, we grow our profession. And I think that's really important. So thank you both I'll so much. I'll leave you with this. Yeah. With, and Karina's in the audience, but uh, Carolyn was also in the audience when we did the Lean Green Belt a month ago. But, you know, great students make for great programs. And there's no doubt about it. I, I've encountered so many great students with the IISC over time. And it, it's made for some really great programs. Well said. Yeah. And to add to that, um, I just have to say that, yeah, having a, a very good learning environment uh, helps to learn better and more. Uh, so in the case of our, our course uh, with Paul, uh, I'd say that he's uh, 
his way of conducting decisions was great in the uh, interaction that we had, like having a very small group to interact to interact with yeah. that helped a lot. So that that's great. Uh, so just to, to, to add to what Paul said, great uh, students, I'd say great students make a great learning environment because <laughs> we all are students at the end of the, of the day, we are learning from every single uh, thing that we face in life. So yeah, it, it was a great experience. And thank you uh, both for this opportunity. To. Oh, yeah. Thank you both. Um, and I, I really great point, Karina, that uh, in some ways we're all students, in some ways we're all instructors. So thank you both for <laughs> playing both of those roles and, and for everything that you do for our profession. Thank you for the opportunity. You're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for listening to this episode of Problem Solved, the IISC podcast, a production of the Institute of Industrial and Systems Engineers in Metro Atlanta. This podcast is produced by David Brandt, Keith Albertson, and Michael Hughes, and edited by David Brandt. You can listen to all episodes of Problem Solved and learn about sponsorship opportunities by visiting our website, podcast.iise.org. You can also learn more about IISE at the Institute's website, www.iise.org.